I believe we are on live, everyone. Uh, this Welcome to the uh, OTJ Summer Sessions 21 uh, session, Global Discussion on the Future of Relationship Between Technology and Language Education. A uh, very long title for what I think will be actually a very, very interesting uh, conversation. Um, there are a lot of people here that uh, have um, basically gone through this pandemic from uh, maybe, uh, depending on your location, from January of 2020 all the way up to now. And uh, it was actually Adam Jenkins' idea to, hey, why don't we get together all of these people that we know that have come into OTJ who are actually heads of professional development groups to come in and maybe talk to each other because that's what I think OTJ excels at. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jose Domingo Cruz. I will be moderating all of this. And, um, and I would like to actually take a moment before we actually start speaking with everyone to actually name everyone who's on our panel. Um, Adam, I think you can you can hand out spotlighting, right? Um, not right now. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, then uh, then I'll I'll spotlight everyone as we go. But uh, first, um, if you can just wave your hand as I, I call your name, uh, Raya Meditok is here from Cotisol, and uh, she's the first vice president of that organization. Uh, Wayne Malcolm is a director of program. Uh, Wayne, give us a bit of a wave there. Uh, our director of program and also the uh, director of the national conference. Uh, I'm sorry if I screw this up. Emerita Banyadas uh, is the president of Latin Call. How did I do on your name pronunciation? <laughs> okay, good. Um, Ken Lee is the vice president of PAC Call and executive of the Glow Call series of conferences. Thank you for coming, Ken. Uh, uh, Jakub Dauda, are you here? He's going to come later, Eric? He is he here. He raised his hand. He oh, raised he his did? hand. I'm sorry, I missed it completely. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, and uh, Georgios, I think, will be joining us a little later if you're not here already, George. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, he'll be joining us a little later. He's the uh, TESOL Gulf president, and, uh, and uh, Jakuba is the founder and head of the Speaking English WhatsApp Association Africa. Very interesting group, actually. Uh, over there, the guy with the background that says International Virtual Exchange Project is not surprisingly the head of the Asia Pacific Virtual Exchange Association. His name is Eric Hagley. He's the chair of that association. And uh, maybe a lot of you know David Juto, good friend of mine, founder and owner of Online Teaching Japan. Hi, everybody. Uh, I got a B in the room. I got to try to take care of. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the joys of online conferencing. Okay, uh, that's okay. He's going to go last in the, uh, the coming lineup of speakers here. What we thought we would do is um, get everyone to make a few short comments. Ah, Jakuba, nice to see you there. I make a few short comments uh, in a row and then maybe uh, get on to um, some other questions that I've prepared. Uh, and then I hope uh, if we can keep things compact, and I know I'm not helping by talking so much, uh, by, uh, uh, by doing that, we can give uh, uh, audience members a chance to uh, talk to them as well as the panel members to talk to each other. Ah, George, there you are. George, give us a wave. There you go, buddy. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, I'm going to call these names in order. Uh, so first, uh, Rhea, uh, Cotisol, first vice president, uh, would you like to give um, your perspective on, on the topic at hand? Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me fine? Yep, yep. Okay, great. Well, I'm really excited to be part of this group. And Jose says, oh, I feel nervous. I find I feel it too. And it's the opposite of being bored. It's being excited. So I'm really excited to um, be part of this very diverse group so we can get lots of perspectives and make some new connections. That's my favorite thing about what has happened in the pandemic is how we've been able to cross borders so easily with this electronic uh, medium. So first of all, Cotisol is Korea TESOL since 1982. And there are a few TESOL organizations here, but this is the biggest one, um, including expats. I joined Cotisol in 2017, first as a chapter or regional leader, and then as a national leader, which right now I'm the first vice president in the National Council and the chair of our upcoming national conference that I'll talk about a little bit later. I came to Korea in 2002. And so it's about half 
of my adult life. <laughs> and I have had the opportunity to teach various ages, including kindergarten, uh, public elementary. Right now I'm working at a university. Before the pandemic, I was very active in traveling all over the nation. Korea being a very compact place, and it's quite cheap and easy to get everywhere, that's an advantage. We have a very tight knit community in our ELT organization. So if you get involved in our meetings, it's easy to meet everyone quite quickly. Because when we have an international conference, particularly, everyone gets together and you can meet people face to face. Of course, that all changed when the pandemic came along. So uh, my background in my master's was in digital media and English education. And actually before the pandemic, I had flipped my classroom and I really love working with technology. So I had that advantage, but of course there are a lot of challenges that we faced. Um, it allows us to connect with people, but not in the same tangible way. And so um, I think for each of the age groups in Korea, they were, I mean, by teachers teaching different age groups were impacted differently. How soon we would get vaccinated is different depending on the uh, ages of the students that we teach. And the G7 countries in the world are hoarding vaccines. So, <laughs> the vaccine rollout is all at a different pace. And I think we can see um, a bit of a disparity, well, not a bit, but quite a disparity in how the pandemic is giving everyone an opportunity to manage this. Um, I think it's, it's a good thing to bring up. So my talk is mostly focused on publishing and conferencing. And particularly for me, um, we, I was the advisor to the national conference in 2019, which would, was planned to be offline. And then suddenly the pandemic came and we quickly found a way to go online. And we were surprised it was very successful and exciting, um, but also very stressful. And we had to kind of jerry-rig a lot of stuff and just dive into the unknown. And since then, we have had our international conference online, which went really well. Many chapter meetings, local meetings are online, but of course, a lot of people within our organization deeply crave human connection and the face-to-face -face meetings. And we, we keep thinking, okay, just a little bit longer and then it'll happen. Oh, maybe not, just a little bit longer. And I think it's that state of perpetual waiting that is the most stressful for a lot of us. I'm sure you can relate. Um, conference coming up to share and we decided to combine the conferencing with something fun a film festival um, which we're hoping will speak to heart to heart connections and providing people with some a little bit of entertainment and fun the conference will be uh, the filmmaking festival aspect we're asking people to produce films not in their native language. So my first language is English. If I wanna make a short film, I should make it in Korean or another language because we want to also really put teachers in the perspective of empathizing with their students. We already ask our students to do their work in their second language. So that's what's coming up. Um, in terms of publishing, because we have a wide variety of student aged teachers, uh, teachers teaching students of different ages, some of us have pressure to publish, some of us less so at the university level, some jobs do require publishing. And I do see that that's moving in the direction more like that, like it is in Japan. Um, I wanted to mention how I became connected to OTJ, which was really because of the pandemic, was when I discovered the online options that were happening for the JALT, uh, JALT 2019, the first JALT online international conference, I decided to interview the people putting on events and was able to get a lot of solid um, help. In fact, we're using some platforms. Um, thank you, thank you, Wayne, JALT 2020. I get my years mixed up. <laughs> So I am really excited at how it's made the community smaller internationally. And 
I welcome you to uh, reach out to me and to each other to take advantage of this so we can face the challenges that are coming together. There's a lot more that I'd like to say, but I think I've got to watch the time here. How am I with time, Jose? Probably a good spot to start wrapping it up. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm going to drop my event into the chat. So take a look at it. And thank you very much. Okay, next. I look forward Wayne. to hearing the rest. Okay, sorry. Next, Wayne. Go ahead. Wait, I'm sorry, Wayne Malcolm, <laughs> director, director of program for Joe. Uh, yeah, thanks. No problem. Um, yeah, as Jose said, um, director of program for JALT, and um, which basically means I am the coordinator of the International Conference and Materials Exhibition that happens every year. So over the past few years, uh, my first conference was 2019, then 2020, now 2021, and I'm on the board of directors until 2022. So next year will be my final conference. Um, yeah, the only thing I really have to say is, is that this situation that we're in right now, this pandemic has really yielded, um, yeah, has really yielded us great opportunities. Of course, there's a lot of drawbacks, but I think a lot of opportunities and to see people maybe we wouldn't normally see in a face-to-face -face situation and to talk with people and do things that we might not normally do in a face-to-face -face situation. For example, I am much more adept to online teaching tools, technical teaching tools, um, and using different platforms in the classroom. Uh, I am a bit of a analog type of guy when it comes to teaching. Um, if you can't, if you can't get it across, if you can't get it across with uh, basically a chalkboard or a piece of paper and a pencil, because quite a few people in the world teach and have to learn without technology. Um, so we're kind of blessed in Japan and even Korea and some places in urban areas to have technology. But so I try to take an analog approach and get my students really involved in talking with each other and et cetera, and kind of learning that way. So this has been a great learning curve for me because I've been learning all these online teaching tools and whatnot. So it's been kind of fun to play with this stuff and really get in there and see how the students grasp onto it. So I think that's one of the major paradigm shifts. And as far as conferencing is concerned, what we're gonna talk about today, uh, professional development, it's a huge paradigm shift because there's no going back. Um, I think we're gonna go face to face again. Like Rhea just said, we all crave human contact and seeing our friends and colleagues and stuff. And you get so much out of a face to face conference, but there's gonna be that online component because not everybody can travel to a central location. And now that we've developed all these online tools, going back is just, it seems almost criminal to kind of then just hoard all the great information that we have and can share when, when we can share it, we can share it and we can share it relatively easily um, across the world. So I think it opens up more opportunities and more doors uh, for people. Uh, and from my perspective, it's been very interesting because my first conference in, in, in 2019 was a face-to-face -face conference full on face to face. It was great. It was so dynamic. And I was like, wow, this is what it's going to be like. And then 2020 comes, we're planning face to face and we have to make this call to go online. So then we all shift to online. We're like, oh, wow. Wow. That was, that was crazy. We did it. It was a good experience. Then we all thought, okay, we're going to go back face to face and maybe both kind of do both. So this year, Jolt was planning to do two conferences uh a face-to-face -face, and then the next weekend leading into a online conference uh and as the delta variant started taking taking hold and started uh spiking and going crazy stuff we made the call to go back straight to online so this year's conference is going to be 100 percent online and um yeah and that's going to be 
you can just tag, you can look at jolt.org to get all that information about uh, the conference and how it's going to be online. It's on my various screen savers here. The date, the date over here, and then the actual website over here. Um, so, and my head is Mount Fuji. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's what's happening over here. And from my perspective, is just seeing this massive kind of paradigm shift in many ways. The past three years have been three very different conferencing experiences for me, planning experiences, um, and using a lot of different tech tools and talking with a lot of different people, uh, including this uh, OTJ community, obviously. That's why we're all here. Um, it's been a huge, huge wealth of, again, learning and very, very, very proud and happy to be part of what's happening here. Um, unfortunately, the background obviously is the uh, pandemic. So, but, you know, we're making uh, very nice lemonade out of some lemons. I'm finished. Okay, Wayne, thank you very much. Um, I, oh my God, morning. somebody just called me. Okay, sorry, that was my phone. Um, wow, that's embarrassing. Uh, I wanted to mention before we uh, move on that uh, if any of the audience would like to ask a question of the panelists, uh, please uh, put your questions in chat or hang on to them until the end when we can start uh, raising hands and taking them. Uh, otherwise, uh, we wanna give as much time as possible to the speakers and the speakers speaking to each other. So we'll put that towards a little bit of the end. Okay, uh, next up is uh, Emerita Bañadas, Latin Call President. Thank you, Jose, and thank you for spelling my name correctly. I know that it's a hard thing to do. Well, uh, here in Latin America, uh, we are um, 33 countries, and we also sometimes tend to include the Caribbean. We have the situation of a tremendous impact of having like 165 million uh, of students going from face-to-face uh, -to -face classes to completely online uh, situations. Well, um, the most difficult issue we have been facing, I would say is the digital divide. Uh, because in our region, uh, most of the, the students don't have access to internet connection not to devices uh, such as computers or tablets, uh, mostly um, mobile phones uh, are covered in 100%, I would say. So that is the, the device we should uh, point to if we want to reach our students uh, in the online settings that we have been going through because most of the classes have been uh, coming on online. The problem is that they cannot reach uh, the number of students that we would like to because they don't have the devices, they don't have the connections, they live in rural areas. And therefore, uh, most of them use their cell phones and they get some facilities at the university, which is the place where uh, people in our association mostly work. And um, so uh, we are totally teaching languages, trusting on devices such as the cell phones from our students. And we have been lucky enough at the university settings uh, to get um, a learning management systems such as Canvas or Teams, and we've been provided with Zoom, et cetera. Uh, but our students, don't have access to those. Um, they do have access to the learning management systems and to Microsoft 365, for example, but they don't have the tools to ac access them appropriately. So this has been a hard issue for us to deal with. And actually, we are now putting together a uh, next week on a meeting which I would like to invite you all and I will later send you the link where we'll be discussing uh, all the lessons that we have learned 
so far from these unprecedented situations that we have been through in Latin America and uh, how we can cope with what we've been uh, facing with our students and in what ways could we uh, take advantage of what we have learned and what comes next. And so uh, you will all be invited to attend that and to hear in detail about every situation that we have been dealing with here in Latin America. And Marita, you're done? Yes. Oh, uh, you, you still got about a minute, if you'd like, a minute and a half, actually. Okay. Um, well, there has been uh, an impact in many different uh, impacts on many different uh, aspects. Particularly, I have noticed um, a high impact on mental health of the students and of the teachers because even though, for example, in my case, I was working for more than 20 years on creating an online teaching uh, for teaching English uh, or to students at my university. But nevertheless, I have felt overwhelmed because I used to work on a blended learning and modality, but now I'm fully online. So uh, I, I have felt overwhelmed with the number of hours and the teaching loads that teachers have, for example, more than um, 20 hours of direct teaching online. And in, this is at the university, but in high school education, teachers are faced with 40 hours of direct teaching online. So there has been a problem of transferring transferring uh, our usual uh, fully face-to-face -face curriculum into uh, an online curriculum. And nobody has been trained to do that. Okay. And, and so that has been a key issue in the difficulties that we've been facing. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next up uh, we have uh, all the way from, I believe from, uh, Ken, you're from Singapore? No, you're from Malaysia. Malaysia. I'm very, very <laughs> sorry. That was uh, that was horrible of me. Ken uh, from Malaysia, uh, vice president of PAC Call and executive of the Glow Call series of conferences. Uh, your turn, sir. Thank you so much, Jose. And uh, it is such a privilege to be invited to this uh, OTJ forum. It's actually the first time. So I've been in a cocoon for a long, long time. And uh, I sort of, uh, when Eric invited Su Ming, who is the president of PAC Call, and uh, Su Ming thought that I, I'll be uh, more suited for this particular forum because I do quite a bit of work with uh, uh, you know, teacher professional development since this is on teacher professional development as well as using technology. And I also like to inform uh, the rest of the panels that I have also invited uh, uh, my co-researcher and also a very dear friend of uh, mine. We have been working on a couple of uh, interesting projects and she comes from um, uh, her name is Cynthia in a while you see Cynthia is actually you can see her face now in a while Cynthia will talk um, Cynthia it's very interesting if you look at the geographical situation of uh, Malaysia in particular we are made up of West Malaysia and East Malaysia West Malaysia being the peninsula East Malaysia is over to the Borneo side so one of the main reasons why I felt it was really important to really uh, you know to hear the voice from East Malaysia particularly where Cynthia is based, um, is to you know, share a little bit of uh, our experiences speci specifically dealing with the pandemic. So I, I just have a screen to share. I know our time is really uh, very short. I, I will just zoom straight into, into the slide. And uh, um, yeah, so I think you can see the slide. So I sort of, I'm sorry I'm using the Nottingham one because I actually work in Nottingham, Malaysia. I hope you can all see this. And um, so uh, what, what we will be doing will be very quickly talking about the scenario in Malaysia. Um, well, I, I know uh, PECO represents the Asia Pacific, but uh, where Suming and I, we are based in Malaysia, I think it's, it's really good to talk about the situation in Malaysia. It's, it's, 
we started really well in Malaysia. We were one of the few countries that, you know, people felt that we were doing a great job in, in you know, controlling the pandemic. But, well, I think it's now well known in the world now how, how bad we have, uh, you know, fed <laughs> in just within um, half a year after we were praised by quite a number of countries for being able to handle the pandemic well, we then, you know, went into a serious problem. And I think we are now one of the worst off as well. And I think a couple of colleagues just now mentioned about, you know, uh, getting access to, you know, the vaccine and all that is a problem. And yeah, we, we are now trying our best. So I wanted to talk about that. So I, I very quickly, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about three key issues will be uh, very quickly. I'll be just talking about uh, the challenges. Uh, we study uh, East Malaysia and West Malaysia. Uh, we will talk about a very small scale study that uh, we conducted um, to find out from teachers who were thrown into emergency remote teaching and what were the challenges that they faced. And then, um, well, time permits, maybe, maybe that we can keep for future talk, uh, maybe later on, about some of the activities that uh, Cynthia and I have been doing moving forward, uh, you know, in terms of what we are doing. So uh, uh, I will hand this over to Cynthia. Cynthia, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, thanks, uh, Dr. Lee. Yeah, I'm, hi, hello. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to this um, forum. It's, a, it's, a, it's an honor. So I'm um, just going uh, straight to what we want to share today. So um, the biggest challenge for Malaysia during this pandemic um, is related to issues um, of digital divide. As you can see on the slide here, uh, these are some of the headlines from the local newspapers highlighting um, the challenges and difficulties faced by our students as they try their very best to um, participate in online uh, teaching uh, and learning sessions during the pandemic. Uh, so can we go to the next slide, uh, Dr. Lee? So, uh, so we have some data uh, from a survey conducted that by the Malaysia uh, Ministry of Education. Um, so this study involved um, parents and students. So what they found out uh, was that 36.9% of students in Malaysia do not actually have any devices and the ownership of hardware and electronic devices for learning from home is limited. Um, so this is um, a situation which uh, represents the whole of Malaysia. So uh, in the next slide, uh, next slide please. So um, this is zooming into um, the situation in East Malaysia, where I'm currently based. So this is a study conducted by the Sabah Education Department. And um, they found out that even though 98% of teachers in Sabah are prepared to conduct online teaching, but unfortunately, less than 50% of our students are not uh, fully equipped. Um, they have problems with um, internet connectivity as well as uh, or lack, uh, lack of um, devices, suitable devices to participate. And so, um, yeah, can, can we go to the next slide? Um, so this one, um, uh, Dr. Lee will share. Yeah, so that, that was a little bit uh, uh, a sneak preview of actually what happened in East Malaysia. So I'm going to talk about something that, uh, you know, we, we did. I'm, I'm based in KL, I'm with the University of Nottingham. And obviously, the University of Nottingham is situated uh, just around around 30 kilometers from Kuala Lumpur. And uh, so we, we also wanted to find out from teachers who were you know, thrown into uh, you know, this situation where they had to teach online. And uh, interestingly, from a small scale study that we conducted, we found uh, a few key challenges uh, with regards to teaching and learning with technology. Uh, what, one of the issues, even though we are in KL, is about accessibility. Uh, internet connectivity is still an issue uh, certain areas. Um, access to devices as well as the readiness of teachers in terms of tech savviness, um, notwithstanding social inequality as well as income inequality, even in the heart of KL, we do have some the rich and poor as well. Um, another issue that we also face with, with is the learner behavior. Um, we find that the, the most challenging is to try to engage learners um, in the lesson, um, and also the fact that the reluctance to turn on cameras or mic. And uh, in terms of teaching, and teaching activities, we have issues with interaction, um, you know, technological limitation, and so on and so forth. So I will not go on too much. I think I, I'm quite aware of the uh, 
am I doing big time? I am trying to check. Uh, you're 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 okay for just a few more seconds, Ken, right, but we okay, might want to stop yeah, it up. Okay, just to sum up, you know, the, the, it's not all doom and gloom about to say, you know, and, and this is like us meeting here in OTJ. So it's a classic example. So it's all all not not doom and gloom, there are silver lining. For example, one of the key things that come out of, of this is the teacher's resilience. We, we don't have time, I think we can talk more about this uh, issue about teacher resilience, and this is what we found in our study. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll, I, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, we'll, we'll talk more in a short while. Thanks. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Uh, right, I, I, got, I got you, Ken. Okay. Thanks, um, thanks Jose. No problem. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, this is my first job actually cutting people off. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, okay. You're doing a good job. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Uh, Jakuba, uh, De Dauda Jakuba, founder and head of a very interesting organization, uh, Speaking English WhatsApp Association Africa. Now, for those of you who don't know WhatsApp, I'm sure uh, you're going to find out. Basically, it's a chat, uh, a chat software. Jakuba, you're up. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning in your side. You are all in the morning, but... Uh... Afternoon, Thank you actually. very much. Oh, afternoon, but here is very early in the morning, around 3 a.m. <laughs> Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this important uh, gathering where we share and take from all of us. Uh, Speaking English uh, platform was a WhatsApp group I created, as you can see, the logo of it. Uh, it was based on these COVID-19 issues, which uh, most of the people were reluctant and uh, they were locked in their own houses. So uh, I decided to be part of uh, virtual exchanges, attending to conferences and all these things. And that is when I get inspired on looking into my own problem in my own community, how I can solve issues, how I can help my students and even teachers, because the speaking English platform is for teachers. Uh, I, it has gone from students, because I was teaching English, and my students were not able to speak English. And looking at the language, where you don't speak it dies within you, I decided to make a classroom research to find out exactly what is the cause, what is the problem uh, that my students cannot speak. English. And that's where I went to speaking activities and I discovered that even teachers among themselves from the survey I made, even teachers among themselves, especially in Niger Republic, could not master the language, could not speak English fluently. And I decided to say, if the teacher cannot speak, then how can you ask the student to speak? And that's the reason of even creating the Speaking English platform, which is now uh, almost for 12 countries in uh, 10 countries, eight, nine countries in Africa, one in UK, India, and even uh, uh, Malaysia. So these are the people involved in speaking English platform. And it's made only on speaking. You only speak, no writing, or we discuss topics, relevant topics that are really uh, affecting our syllabuses, uh, the level of our students, and the problems we are facing while making all these uh, uh, the topics we teach in speaking English with students. And teachers also, uh, it has gone beyond the speaking. It has gone where technology has come during the pandemic for teachers to even come online uh, make research, get involved in international levels of uh, gathering, meeting, and uh, really to empower even the teachers to go beyond the classes. Because not thinking that always uh, teaching can go face to face. Uh, COVID-19 has shown the opposite of it. Uh, people have to come uh, with technology, which is very hard in my side here because uh, having a, a network very hard here, uh, getting connected because that's the head, uh, let me say the, the, the headache of especially in Niger, especially in the afternoon time, which is very difficult. So this really gave me uh, the courage 
of going through and setting up the platform and for teachers to discuss. And thank God from the result we got many African teachers uh, with many testimonies, we got that people were get inspired. People are getting from it. People are sharing and getting uh, much from it. And people were really encouraged to even set up uh, online classes through the WhatsApp group experience that people got. They set up uh, classes, online classes with their own students to teach during the pandemic and to even encourage teachers to even participate, as I said, in uh, international conferences through Zoom, especially through webinars, go to meeting and so on. And it was through all these uh, conferences that I got inspired, as I said, and that really gave me the courage of uh, meeting virtually with many people. Uh, that was when I come across Eric in one of our uh, Zoom conferences. And from his presentation, I was inspired to go more because he's talking about Moodles at that particular time. And, uh, an unknown terrain, which I don't know, and I wanted to find out, I immediately uh, sent him a message and we got into. He's part of the Speaking English platform members. He do participate time to time. And I hope many of you will join, give us uh, the different that diversity of culture, the diversity of uh, accents of people so that all that people can benefit from the world entirely. Uh, I think uh, I'm done with that. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much, Jacoba. That was very interesting. Okay, next up uh, from, uh, I, I believe you're in Saudi Arabia now, uh, George. Uh, George Oskornbas, uh, Tesla Golf president. Go ahead. Sir. Hi, yes, I am in Saudi now. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jose, for this uh, event. So my name is Georgios or George. I'm Greek. I'm living in Saudi Arabia and currently the president of TESOL Golf. So just to make certain that everybody knows that um, when we talk about the golf area, I know there are some political um, aspects of that word. So when we talk about the golf in our area, I'm talking about the countries around the, either the Arab Gulf or the Persian Gulf, as you may want to call it. So we're talking about Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and uh, Iraq. So our association started in actually right before the pandemic. So it was supposed to be a face-to-face -face association. We had our first event in January. Uh, we held it in Kuwait, and then the pandemic hit. So we um, took a little break for a few months and then we kind of put ourselves together. We didn't have a formal board, we didn't have bylaws, and it was kind of challenging. So we took the time to prepare and we went um, online in July after January, I think. And then we started having events, we started having many conferences, we addressed different kinds of um, audiences, young learners, um, our teachers having technology issues. And this is something that I wanted to also mention about the Amerita said that, you know, um, in this part of the world, people think that we have lots of technology and we have so much, you know, um, it's there are wealthy countries, but we don't. <laughs> um, the internet is not very good. Students don't have the technology. Teachers don't know how to use technology. So it was a learning curve for everyone. Um, teachers as well as students. So the highlight that I wanted to share was that we have a social event, maybe some of you know it's called Taco Tuesdays. So it's a social event that gets everyone together every Tuesday as the, the event calls itself. And it's something that we're proud. We have about 40 up to now. We started last August and um, we're having different kind of speakers. They talk about a topic they want. There's not um, a certain way that they can present. They can present, they can make it a discussion. It can be you know, interactive, a workshop and so on and so forth. And we found that this has brought people together. We do have presenters from the Gulf, of course, but internationally as well. So what I'm also proud of is our board. And we tried because you know it's difficult to get people from different countries to work together, but um, because we were working online, it was easier. 
and just want to share the screen for just one second to see the um, our board members and I'm glad, glad that are the one of board members here. So we do have a presentation from almost all the Gulf countries, but we also have international uh, board members just to make certain that we are, you know, um, addressing our audience in the Gulf, but also around the world. And um, I just want to say a couple of things for OTJ. So I do like this community. And uh, the reason that I think I like it the most is for the help and support that it provided uh, during the pandemic and now, and it's instant. And I, I don't know, I, I feel it's like expertise coming from personal experiences of users. And I think this is what I really enjoy about this community, which we're striving to have in different other groups, but I think this has been an excellent, uh, if I say selling point of OTJ. Thank you, Jose. I was muted. Uh, you're <laughs> Wayne like that one. Um, uh, George, thank you very much. You're very, very welcome. Uh, you do have about a minute left though, if you want to take it or it's up to you though. That's okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, next up is uh, Eric Hagley, head of APIA, the Asia Pacific Virtual Exchange Association. Go, sir. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, yeah, look, I might go back and start to talk a little bit more about um, technology, I suppose, uh, because that was definitely a big part of the title. Um, and I, I kind of feel that technology has really been at the forefront of language learning right throughout history. And we're, we're going back a long way. I mean, um, the printing press, really, that's, that's technology. That's technology advancement. And uh, it was obviously the biggest, uh, had the biggest influence on language learning. Um, it uh, changed the way uh, humans interact, really. Um, and from there, then, okay, language started to become accessible to a lot more people. Um, the radio, another wonderful tool. Um, obviously, well, it's, it's generally considered to be surpassed now. There's TV. Um, all, these, all these technological advancements have really been a, a boon for language learning. Um, and more recently, I think the big influences on language education have been uh, corpus linguistics. Um, I don't think it gets as big a rap as it deserves. It's just phenomenal uh, what corpus linguistics has done for language learning, particularly second language learning. Um, from that, you know, we've got the, uh, the word lists. You know, which words are the most commonly used, which are, are the, therefore, which are the most important, uh, which words come after, you know, the whole um, understanding of language has really been developed from that corpus linguistics. Um, graded reading developed because of corpus linguistics, amazing technology there. Uh, computational linguistics, you know, algorithms that have been used to, uh, to develop computer translation tools. These, this is another field that has really changed the way that um, language classes are, uh, are basically. Um, so technology is certainly been with us right throughout the history of all language learning. Um, when the pandemic hit, okay, it it really took over, and uh, obviously the the internet was a hugely influential uh, part of that. Um, uh, so all of all of those other tools that I've mentioned up until now, though, they're they're really wonderful for those understanding and remembering. Um, which are at the bottom of uh, Bloom's taxonomy, um, uh, but incredibly important for language learning. For me, though, um, probably the most exciting uh, aspect of technology in language classes, and, and one that I think is changing the way language learning is occurring around the world is virtual exchange. Um, as mentioned, I am the uh, head of the Asia Pacific Virtual Exchange Association. Um, I have been doing virtual exchange 
virtual exchange is basically where we get our students online. My classroom, whether it's in Otaru or Mururan, regional uh, Japan, my students via virtual exchange can interact with students from anywhere else in the world via virtual exchange. And that's, uh, that's a really uh, huge, huge development in language learning, I think, because it, it opens up the other higher level options um, in an international aspect uh, that Bloom offers us. Um, but we also have to go back and, you know, um, Emerita and Yakoba have shown us, as, as has uh, Ken, that, um, you know, the, the really basics are important. Um, if you haven't heard the phrase, you know, we need to Maslow before we can bloom, look that up because it is so important today um, that uh, you know, we, we start to work on trying to improve the lives of people so that they have those basics. And the basics are what we need to get our students to uh, really you know, start to get into uh, Bloom's taxonomy, of course. Um, and, and of course, as Ken said, you know, we also have to acknowledge the problems that teachers are facing during this time as well. Um, Jacoba, wow, you, you are uh, an absolute um, amazing person there. I think uh, what you are doing to help out the teachers in Africa there, um, I've, I'm certainly very honoured to uh, have been able to be a part of your group. I, I hope others can join as well. Um, so yeah, fr from my perspective, um, technology has been a huge part of language learning, uh, language education right throughout history. It's uh, more so perhaps now than ever before because of the pandemic. Um, there are some really wonderful tools out there. Uh, virtual exchange, I think is a, a, a huge one, um, but, uh, I, yeah, I hope that uh, others can join virtual exchange um, going forward because it's something that I think even when we move back to face-to-face -to -face classes, um, students can't just pick up and travel even if they are able to. Um, socioeconomically, it's very difficult. Let's um, offer them virtual exchange um, as another option. Okay, that's where I'll finish up for now, though. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, let's okay, go. Thanks, Eric. Uh, David Juto, founder and owner of Online Teaching Japan. Hi, everybody, and thank you for coming from all different parts of the world today. And thank you, Jose and Adam, for stepping up to the plate big time in OTJ to what I call the, the group of the willing because um, OTJ 18 months ago didn't exist. Japan had, has and had very well established language teaching organizations, but for whatever reason, I wasn't a big member of them. And when the pandemic struck, I had this feeling that mm, I need to learn stuff. And so I made this group and this group sort of evolved out of what I call the willing people willing to help each other, people willing to ask questions and people willing to step up to the plate to do things. And so it sort of evolved over time. And my job was what Adam called the curator, which is I tried to create an environment that I felt would be safe for people to ask questions without feeling stupid. I tried to create an environment where I didn't want to quit. Basically, I wanted a group where I didn't want to leave, which meant I wanted people treating, other, treating each other with respect, with dignity, and simply helping each other. And it manifested itself um, with the help of everybody. The members fell into this idea of just helping each other, and any question was a good question, and trying to keep our focus. And... Again, with people, you know, shortly after the group started, I met Jose and he would bring ideas to me and I'd say, that sounds like a great idea. Or Adam and Jose would bring ideas to me and I said, that's a great idea. So it's really a, a, a group of people with ideas that 
um, just exploded. And it filled a void in uh, teacher preparation because the universities or the schools didn't step up to the plate. They didn't do any training for anybody. So it, it seems that OTJ has been able to offer a solution in the time of the pandemic. I didn't expect it to last this long. I expected it to last for one semester. Um, but then it, you know, last a year ago, Jose and Adam did summer sessions 2020. And we kind of thought, well, that's, you know, where's it going to go from here? And then, oh, we're online again. <laughs> and then January came and it's like, where are we going to go from here? And it's ooh, in the spring, we're online again. And during that time, though, behind the scenes, you know, uh, Adam and Jose have been working on this summer project again, Summer Sessions 2020, to bring everybody together. Um, and yeah, it just it has become a group that I'm, I'm, I'm happy that to hear comments from some of the members today to say, you know, G Giorgio said that, you know, it's a great place to come for a quick answer. You, you pop it up, some you know, 20 or 30 people will come and give you a quick answer on something or explore the problem. And um, so, I mean, that's, you know, um, but where it goes, what it does from here, what the pandemic does, I'm not sure, we're not sure. And so maybe you'd like to join us this evening when we talk about the future of OTJ. Um, and um, anyway, I thank everybody for coming today and let's get some ideas out there on the table of how we can, uh, you know, to, to, what, what the title of the, the conference is today. So, um, I'll hand the mic back over to Jose, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, now we move into the part of this uh, session where we talk more on, on questions that I quite selfishly prepared. So these are my questions. These are the things that I want to ask. Uh, but if you, as a member of the audience or as one of the panelists, would like to make this a little bit more of a conversation, that's fine. The people who are in the audience who are going to be asking questions um, please write your questions in chat. Uh, if you would like to ask a follow-up question, please make it short. Uh, we'll do it Jeopardy style. Uh, please form your statement in the phrase of a question. All righty, uh, first question uh, we're gonna ask. Um, I'm gonna ask um, Rhea and Wayne, if you guys can prepare your microphones. Um, because both of you are involved in conferencing uh, in your respective groups. I wanted to ask you, uh, Ray, you talked a little bit about it, uh, how you saw changes either in the conferencing that you do or changes maybe in the publishing that comes out of the conference called papers that you do. So one quick example is that uh, Rhea's group, Cotisol, uh, employed uh, Discord, um, you know, gaming uh, communication software as a way to get every or keep everybody together. Um, technology like that, how, did, how do you figure that that actually um, uh, figured in what you're doing with conferencing now? Ray, why don't you go first? Got a couple of minutes or so. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to bullet point some of the challenges that were going through my mind as you spoke up, and then some of our solutions and maybe invitations to help solve some of our issues. <laughs> the first challenge was finding a digital platform. And we did source from within Korea. We also experts in Japan, and that was a result of network. Um, we tried a WordPress site. We've tried the platform that um, Jelt uses and explored lots of options. Within the platform, within the platform, I also, sorry. Some of the challenges are payment options. Korea doesn't allow PayPal easily. If we want people to join our conference, then it can be really difficult. People have to actually go to the bank and do a transfer. It can be very tedious. Uh, that's why then the next event we're having is completely free, by the way. All you have to do is click and join. Um, that's one of the other things. And pandemic fatigue is another issue as well as mental health for teachers and students both. I think the ongoing um, difficulty of many other things, many other personal challenges for our volunteers who are organizing the event is another thing that we really work on. But yeah, we do use Discord and we are planning to gamify our event. So we want to try to make it fun, accessible. And as the pandemic fatigue goes on, 
we have lots of beautiful sessions. Working out time differences can be another problem as we can see here today. When we want people from other nations to join us, it, it can be hard to figure out when we can schedule them, but we do our best to work around that. Like, for example, instead of only having the Saturday and Sunday, we would have different days and try to have different times. So those are the first things that floated up into my mind. And um, yeah, gamifying the event is something we're experimenting with. So we have a Discord channel that was used for gamers and it's more based on voice texting, I believe. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think especially South America is really hard. I know just in traveling, I think it's about a 24 hour journey from South Korea to a lot of places in South America. So obviously, it's really the opposite side of the world. Um, yeah, maybe are there any questions? I'd like to have a little bit of a dialogue with somebody. If we could have Wayne just put his bit in first, Rhea, before we sure. go into the full dialogue. Wayne, why don't you go ahead mm -hmm. and uh, answer that question about changes? Yeah, uh, it's a really big change in the JALT sphere because JALT is... Um, you know, conference is so big, we can have up to like 1600 participants at a conference. So then figuring out how to get all those presentations onto the uh, online sphere was a was a major challenge, uh, especially since we didn't really understand the costs involved at first. So that first year 2020, we we're researching. And the biggest thing that we were looking at really was costs, like how do we get a cost efficient um, platform. I think that's where a lot of it starts is a platform. If you want to go online and you want to do something, you have to figure out a really good uh, platform, depending on how big your conference is. Um, and that's another thing is figuring out your, uh, the challenges of online conferencing anyway, uh, from an organizational standpoint, using technology is what do you really need? Uh, what do you really need in terms of scale? Because I have seen conferences in the past couple of years that had quite a few participants, but the interface was very simple. It didn't really take a whole lot um, from basically a Google form with a bunch of links uh, or, or like a Google sheet with a bunch of links and formatted nicely. And, um, you know, that gets sent out to participants ahead of time because they have a very strict registration period. So registration period is from A date to B date, that's it. And those people who register, they register with their emails and they get that link to the, to the place. So very, very simple. Of course, that leaves out anyone coming on, quote unquote, on site. So there's some challenges there. Um, I will say it helps if you like a community like OTJ, where there are so many people who are technically proficient well, with technology, uh, dipping into that community, right? So ask around in your community, what kind of services people do other than language teaching, because obviously programming uh, online site is different than language teaching, but people will surprise you. And that was one of the great things about the JAL community is that there's so many different people who just kind of stepped up to help deal with the online side. So our challenges got mitigated by the fact that we have such a diverse professional community. Um, so knowing your community really helps mitigate, mitigate a lot of different challenges. Okay, thanks yep. Wayne. Um, next pair of uh, speakers. Oh, I'm sorry, are there any questions? Uh, I don't see anything in chat. If you have a quick question, you can maybe uh, take a look at uh, your reactions button and raise your hand there. But uh, let's go on. Okay, uh, next pair of people who are going to be speaking is uh, are, are Ken and Jakuba. And what I thought I would ask them uh, is this one. How do you see, I mean, you can, you can look at this in terms of positives and negatives, but um, in terms of peer access to communication though, among faculty, among teachers, what did you see regress? What did you see progress uh, during the pandemic or during this time as we were um, uh, going through uh, changes in technology? Uh, Ken, why don't you uh, try that one first? I, I think um, 
you know, while, while the pandemic is, is, is challenging, but it has actually opened up a lot more possibility. I mean, the very fact that what we are meeting now, um, you know, online, uh, what I found really, really uh, has helped a lot of us in, in teaching um, with technology is uh, with online, um, you know, availability, it saves so much time in terms of traveling, costs, and we were we were able to do a lot of wonderful stuff, uh, you know, through um, all sorts of uh, online technologies. I mean, I've personally, I've participated in uh, a couple of, in fact, yesterday I was in an online conference as well, um, using the Microsoft Teams platform and trying to learn this and obviously try to relate that to to PECCOR. Uh, we have been a very traditional organization. Most of our conferences, we have always been, um, most of our members are based in Japan with uh, you know, a couple of helpful colleagues over there. We have been doing it using Moodle as a, our major platform, but each time we do, we have, I mean, since my involvement in, in PECCOR uh, and Glucose series uh, 10 years ago, 20, beginning of 2010, until now we have been doing the traditional ones. So when the pandemic struck last year, I think it really caught us unaware and uh, we, we had to postpone um, Glow Call for the first time. We have never actually had a break. We always have it yearly. And so 2020, we were not able to host it. And 2021, uh, we decided that we will go online. So this coming December is the first time that we'll be doing. We are not really sure how things will pan out to be to, to, will pan out. We're not really sure because uh, while we have our technical experts uh, based in Japan probably to help us, I think um, Rain mentioned about this expertise, this community that we can call on. Maybe we might ask for help in terms of how we can actually run this uh, uh, you know, conference well. And, and so, yeah, I mean, um, while it's, as I mentioned, not doom and gloom, uh, it has actually opened up a lot more possibilities. We are able to attend so many other conferences free. Uh, that's it, uh, you know? So yeah, thanks, Joseph. That's it, yeah. Okay. And I'm very sorry, I, I got the order wrong. I, I mentioned Jacoba's name, I think, as the second speaker on this question, but actually I wanted to ask uh, Emerita Banyadas because she's the yeah. president of Latin Call. Uh, about this question. And if you want me to repeat the question again, Emeritas, basically it's what do you see as progress progress or regress uh, in terms of communication uh, as a result of the pandemic or the result of the shift into technology? Uh, do you mean among teachers? Um, or whatever else that you see that was important. But yes, uh, among teachers, I think we can talk about that. Well, I could actually say that uh, communication has progressed it has really improved because uh, actually uh, uh, some of my students uh, sent me messages, even right now I'm getting messages from them and it is here in Concepcion, Chile, uh, 11.30, which is absolutely awkward. And uh, so I could say that communication has really improved um, considering the opportunities that uh, both students have to reach us through technology and also because of uh, peer help among teachers. We try to help each other in our training needs and um, that has been absolutely um, better accomplished through technology. In fact, uh, within and through Latin American countries, you know, we are 33 countries, our communication has been absolutely enhanced uh, because of the pandemic. And we have seen the need to work together and um, to go through this uh, crisis together, looking for better options of teaching and of sharing ideas along the region. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, next up, our next pair is uh, Eric Hagley, uh, not only the um, uh, 
uh, the chair of Appia, but also um, a high tech guy. He, he knows what he's doing with Moodle. And uh, George Konpas, uh, TESOL Gulf president, uh, wanted to ask them about what they saw before we were talking about communication among faculty and among peers, but the changes that technology has brought that you see to pedagogy. So um, Eric, why don't you try that one first? Uh, Eric, you're, you're muted. muted. <laughs> Sorry, so thank you very much, Jose. Yeah, I might start with a quick story. So in 2019, I was based in um, a regional university up in the north of Japan. And we decided as a family, my wife and myself, that we would be moving back to Australia for various reasons. Anyway, in 2019, at the end of the year, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to be leaving after March. Um, I'd actually like to continue on teaching here in, in some way online. Is that a possibility? And this is at the end of 2019, November. And the teachers there said, there is absolutely no way that we will ever allow an online class to be considered the equivalent of a face-to-face -face class. I wish I'd recorded what they'd said <laughs> because obviously four months later, five months later, that university's entire curriculum was online. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a phenomenal change in a very short space of time. Um, now, at that university, I was uh, probably the most uh, Moodle savvy um, staff member that university was using Moodle. Um, now, I finished in March. The teachers there actually asked me to come up and do daily workshops for them from the beginning of April right through till um, mid-March. And they were, they were paying me out of their own pocket, which was, I, I was saying, no, I don't need any money, but they were paying me. Um, we had um, PE teachers saying, okay, how am I going to do my class online? And so we were brainstorming, okay, how are we going to use Moodle to help you um, do your class and we had uh they had the zoom they had different things so we we ended up doing um you know students doing running around their house or uh in their immediate vicinity um doing other exercises and uh, using the database module to clock that and um, give it to give the data back to this teachers so that the teachers could give them grades. There were um, law uh, legal experts who were giving lessons online and uh, get, how do we get all of these uh, assignments given back to us they'd never done it without paper before. So huge changes overnight. Um, and it had very Obviously, it was an enormous shock for the majority of the teachers. But when they started to see what technology could do, then they were coming online and saying, this is actually very worthwhile. Sorry, I'm probably going over time. But yeah, um, enormous changes, both good, but shocking, but good in that you know, the, a lot of these things they're going to continue with. Sorry, Jorge, uh, George, um, you, you continue on, please. Okay, George, you're up. Great. Um, just to piggyback on what Eric said about universities and online education, um, I mean, that, that was the reality in Saudi Arabia as well and in the Gulf countries, I mean, and then it just changed, you know, overnight. And, you know, now we're talking about online education for distant places and, this and that and the other. So the, the change was, um, I mean, rapid and, uh, but there, there are still some limits but in, in any case. But going back to the original question of Jose, I think, and, I, and I, I mentioned that earlier is that we had assumptions. We had assumptions for faculty, for teachers, for students that they can do things and they had skills. So when that hit, it just, you know, they had, and, and you know, as, as a director of teaching in my university, we just found out that faculty and students had basic, you know, they didn't have basic knowledge of office apps or, you know, emails or of course, online presentation or how to use all of those tools. But I think what we, we 
also realized after a point of, you know, um, extensively presenting about tools, we saw that there was a difference in pedagogy. And, you know, some of us have had, you know, uh, studies in online. I've been a student, a teacher online before the pandemic. And as Amarita was saying uh, before, is that the, transform the, the transformation of a face-to-face -face curriculum to an online one is not the same. So we've stressed more and more that we're still in emergency remote teaching is not online teaching. And as you know, even we're 15, 16 months into this, we're still doing, we're still doing, um, you know, as helping them and assisting them with webinars. Now we're going to be in a hybrid model. We are going back face to face on Sunday, but you know, we have certain limits and restrictions. If, you know, the cases go up, then, you know, and, and this is also something that I want to mention that's, that's there to stay, as it was mentioned before, but it's the alternative. So now we know if there are cases, if there are problems, we can always switch back to online teaching, which wasn't the case before. And, you know, if I have to go somewhere for a conference or for some professional development, I can teach my class online once or twice, which was not, again, the case before. So I think that's a win for us. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, the uh, next question is for uh, Jakuba and David. Uh, how do we address uh, moving forward what we probably saw more obviously this, uh, this, uh, these past 18 months in terms of the, the, the knowledge gap that certain teachers, certain, certain professors had, or maybe even their attitudes towards technology? How do, how do we address that? David, you're the founder of OTJ. Yakuba, you went out on your own and just started doing what you could with what you had. How do you think we address that moving forward or what obstacles do, do you maybe see? Uh, Yakuba, why don't you uh, start on that one? Uh, yeah, that is really a great question. Uh, you know, uh, technology has brought the world very close and uh, more accessible. Uh, in terms of uh, closeness, you can, as teachers, you can share many experiences from across teachers, teachers across the world, attending to conferences, expanding your own experience, getting to CPD, and gave you also another uh, part of you being able to share and see what other people could do. Uh, technology, especially in uh, this speaking, has brought uh, many changes, positive changes, I would say, because initially, I remember in the Nigerian Republic, we have teachers always cry that no material, no material, no material. And that's really gave us the courage of having setting up another WhatsApp group, uh, like just online library, where teachers who just, among all these countries also, just pick any document they need to teach English. And I think that's really a great help from technology. Uh, if teachers could have more materials to teach, I think uh, it's a good uh, step forward and made from the technology. And now looking at the aspect of how we can move forward. Uh, that's where we have a little bit challenge because uh, most of the people here uh, need at least training for online uh, activities, mostly, especially with modules, which is a part of WhatsApp group uh, because sometimes WhatsApp is limited. We have to go to uh, uh, webinars like uh, in modules where you are going to use your mail and I'm still battling with that see how teachers and even their students could uh, get involved with more training uh, where they will be more expanded in pertaining or participating in such activities that would be really great that's I think that's the most challenge we have here getting trained teachers for that. And uh, the way things are moving on, uh, there is really flowers to thrown at uh, COVID-19 because it has given uh, really the opportunity for people, everything to go online. And 
that really help uh, most of the teachers and even their students. Uh, and also in the part of art, it has encouraged the students also to uh, make research, uh, participate in online activities, which is very amazing, especially with the WhatsApp group we created with uh, English clubs also for students. It's really amazing when you see that. It's really also encouraging. I think it's only training for people to go further in that. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope. Uh, Thank you, Jacoba. David. You're welcome. You're welcome, Jose. David. You're there we go. Not muted. Okay. Um, in to answer this question, I'd like to go back to what Eric said, which is, you know, technology, what technology? You know, the printing press was technology. Um, the radio was technology, the TV was technology, the VCR was technology. But in my institution, um, where I've been for 12 years, when I joined that university, they had Moodle, they had uh, Google Suites, they had, uh, what's the Microsoft, Microsoft Office 365 for everybody if you wanted it. But I didn't want it and we had the choice. So I was more like Wayne in the sense, I was more of a paper and you know a, a chalkboard pen, uh, you know the screen and stuff, but, I, but the technology was there. So I was on the side of, you know, the weak technology guy in my faculty, but there was young guys in there. There was, uh, you know, the, the, the owner of teachertools.digital. He worked right beside me. He was sitting there developing stuff while I was going, what are you doing, man? Oh, I'm working on this software stuff. So th there was really high tech guys right in my vicinity in the staff room. But I was like, yeah, that's cool, man. I'm out of here. You know, like, um, so what I noticed that the pandemic did was it, it made guys like me totally aware, wow, we have this stuff already. It was already sitting there, but I wasn't taking advantage of it. And it had the guys who knew this stuff going, hey, this is great. Now we can get to do what we've always wanted to do. Um, we get to use the tools that are already here. And for me, it was a big learning curve. But I have to say, because of... A David, you're muted. You got accidentally muted. Because of OTJ, I was able to kind of wake myself up and join the club of the high tech guys at at my at a comfort level that I can exist with. So I think you know I spoke to my advisor about uh, my group, uh, my uh, department head about two weeks ago, and he said, you know, we're going to move slowly with the technology even when the pandemic ends because still not everybody's buying into it 100 percent and if you jump too quickly then you have to solve more problems than you want you have to fix problem the problem you're trying to solve you create a dozen other problems because if people don't know how to use the technology then so it requires training like Jacoba said you know you have to train you have to be willing to be trained and you have to go looking for the training and um, you, yeah, I think you have to be the kind of person that wants to step up to the plate. So say pandemic beyond, I think the tools are there. We all know about it, but we should, you know, train ourselves and keep, our, keep ourselves abreast. And I'll stop there with that. Um, uh, we have about 10 minutes left, which I reserve for questions uh, between the panelists or between the panelists and the audience. But before we uh, go uh, past this point, I would like everyone to show their appreciation with a round of applause. Could you open up your microphones? Microphones. <laughs> okay, we can take questions uh, with just raised hands. I see a couple of interesting things in the uh, chat if no one raises their hand. And as people are thinking about raising their hands, I think we can start with this one. It's a very interesting one. It's, they came from Wayne. Um, and Wayne, you were talking about uh, the big questions uh, going forward. One was about faculty and the other one was about institutions. Maybe you can just open up your microphone and ask that question directly to the panelists themselves. Yeah, um, I was just thinking from like a kind of like a macro structure, like uh, policy wise. So you have um, like physical broadband, you're talking about like, you know, we're talking about like WhatsApp and things like that, but, and we're talking about devices and stuff, but if you can't actually get the signal to the people, then they have to go someplace, right, to get that signal. So, you know, our teaching is almost uh, based upon a little bit, what actual physical infrastructure can we get 
put in place uh, to get the signal to the cell phone, right? So, um, so that people can actually get the teaching that they need, right? Like how much, how much, you know, how much effect does that have on us uh, eventually? Some somewhere along the line that probably has effect on someone. And the other question was sort of even to piggyback on that was the bigger question is then what value do the powers that be really have in online teaching? Because there's always this debate about brick and mortar, face-to-face -face, and online teaching. How does it go forward? And someone um, articulated that before, like uh, the value, maybe that was uh, Eric, you know, the value of well, we're never gonna go online, now we're online. Um, but do people still believe the value of online teaching is there? same as face-to-face -face teaching, right? So whenever this quote unquote pandemic, whenever this finishes, do they believe that there's this uh, equality? So kind of okay. two big um, things. Let's, uh, let's hear a couple of answers from there, but could we keep them a little bit short? Because I think we're starting to get some questions from the audience. Anybody want to pick up on that? Uh, David, George, you have um, open? Can I, yeah, can oh. I just, uh, for the first question, I think, yeah, there is not, and we have actually seen that there are questions, there are problems with connectivity, there are problems with internet, problems with equipment. But I just wanted to, to give a shout out to all the teachers and all everyone that has helped because we've seen lots of resilience. We've seen, you know, uh, buses in the US and believe it or not, yes, in the US being held as, you know, hotspots for, um, for internet. We've seen the radio being used in Africa. We've seen TV being used. We've seen lots of, you know, low tech, the WhatsApp association. I mean, why would, you know, not, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind, why wouldn't they go on Zoom? Well, because they don't have broadband, they don't have enough internet, right? We've just, Tiso Africa or Africa Alta just did their conference online and they had a separate WhatsApp, you know, WhatsApp sessions with 250 people. So I think there are solutions, but of course, yes, there are problems as well, and they need to be addressed. Sorry, Jose. No problem. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure everyone has sure. their answers and questions. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else want to chime in on that question? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jose. Go. Uh, all right, for, for, for the when questions, uh, online teaching and face-to-face -face teaching both have their own places in educational aspects. Because uh, when you look at face-to-face -face teaching, that is the first step that people uh, believe that people were known well for it, which most of us were trained by face-to-face uh, -face teaching, and we try to think that is the best. But online teaching also uh, is uh, really newly introduced due to COVID-19. I think it was even imposed forced to people mm -hmm. and when when you look at it in that way you know that really uh it is the whole process that has to be changed from beginning to the end like just in face to face you have to set up classes you have to set up infrastructure you have to set everything you have to train teachers for that but look at just within a year and some months look at how it has gone so if the government can really take decision on that, train teachers, train people on that. I think uh, uh, online teaching will be up to 80% uh, good for teachers because uh, online teaching needs technology and its technical aspects. Sometimes one has to be there present to help. And if you are not known to those uh, uh, techniques, it will be very hard for one to cope with online teaching. And that's the differentiation and the point of view I want to give all of that. Thank you all. Thank you, Jacoba. Keep your hand up if you wanted to ask a question. Uh, we see a couple of other things in the chat, but Glenda Gallardo uh, yes. had her hand up first. Um, yes, well, I was going to say something similar to Jacoba. Yes, I agree that a online teaching can also work well, yes, as well as face-to-face. And what I realized in my context is uh, I work at two universities and one of them we teach online. We have been doing that for a number of years, but in the second one, which is this picture that you see behind me, my background, uh, we are doing ERT, yes. But at the beginning, there was a lot of resistance. 
Yes, because we thought, many of us thought it was going to be temporary. So people, teachers were reluctant to learning how to do things at the beginning. And they were like very narrow-minded, no, this is not going to work. And we should wait for another month. The government is going to allow us to go back. So there was a lot of resistance. But once this was accepted, because we saw this was not changing, then things started working and moving different. Yes, in a different way. So then but it it had to be we had to accept it and embrace these new things and it was very challenging because uh, as i said uh, some people thought this was going to be temporary so they they kind of perhaps thought why bother learning this when then we're going to go back to what we are used to doing but once we all accepted that no okay this is I mean, it's going to be longer so let's start doing things uh, as you mentioned there are um, uh, I think people started like feeling we have to row the boat together. And that's when we got together and then we had more WhatsApp group and more WhatsApp groups. And, and there were many chain, I mean, many opportunities. If you had a Facebook, you had invitations for webinars here and there, and you could go everywhere. I, well, I'm from Peru. Yes, right now it's evening here. But I thought, oh, this is very interesting. So let's see what's this about. So I joined you. And this curiosity has taken many of us, I mean, to we were maybe in A, but then we moved forward and we have learned a lot. So there, everything is at the reach of our hands. And well, hopefully you have a good uh, broadband, then uh, you can do many things and you can keep learning and taking courses and here and there. And also my students, now they are, many of them have joined conversation groups and I'm very happy for them because before it was like a club joining, we have to go to this place, it's the traffic and everything. But now it's like, it's there, I can join them. There is one here, if this doesn't work for me for the time zone, I can join this other group. So they are taking many opportunities that they thought it was like very far or not possible, but now it, they have more and more chances. So Glenda, acceptance I'm... was key, that's it. <laughs> okay, good. Thank okay, you, good. thank you, Jose, no, don't worry. I, I'm, I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry about that. It's just a matter of time. Uh, we have only about two minutes left. Um, if I can get you to keep it down to about 15 seconds, maybe a comment from somebody about what Glenda just said. No, yeah, because we have, as teachers, a very difficult time keeping I, it down. I, I, I think, David, I, what I, I really like what uh, Glenda said was, uh, we, we're rowing the boat together. <laughs> and I think um, Jose and Adam understand this very deeply by bringing this group of people together today because we're kind of rowing the boat together, you know? Um, and that, that, I think that's, that's the quote of the day for me. We're rowing the boat together. So it's great. Thank you, Glenda. Okay, a round of applause, not just for that magnificent quote, but for everybody who came, uh, spoke, and attended. Everybody. <laughs> okay, I'm really uh, sorry, Rima. We got to get on to the <laughs> next one. And uh, I, I really encourage you to stick around for it. Uh, I think it'll be really interesting, especially for the teachers of um, younger learners in Japan. But otherwise, please stick around. I think this is going to be a great day uh, for, uh, for uh, online learning and for OTJ and for all of you who attend. Thank you very much for having attended this uh, roundtable discussion. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. OK. Uh, looking for my presenter, if she can uh, turn uh, on her camera. Live stream? Oh, the live stream. Sorry. Thank you very much, sir.